Hi, this is a Conversations with Creatives podcast for Opus. For 26 years and counting, every November, the East Side Arts Society produces the East Side Culture Crawl, a visual arts, design and craft festival in which local artists open their studios to the public. The event is focused on the area bounded by Columbia Street, 2nd Avenue, Victoria Drive and the waterfront, and involves painters, jewellers, sculptors, furniture makers, weavers, potters, printmakers, photographers, glassblowers, ranging from emerging artists to those internationally established. In this episode, four of this year's participants tell us what they have in store for the 2022 crawl, plus discuss their relationship between them, their art and their tools. We'll then finish things off with a holiday bonus section. So sit back, enjoy, and let the inspiration take hold. Louise Selecki Weir is a Canadian sculptor of portraits and figurative works. Through her decades of experience in working with clay, Louise has incorporated techniques that range from classical to modern forensic. She is known for her expressive and sensitive approach and has attracted commissions from organisations such as the Catholic Church and the British Columbia Law Courts. We caught up with Louise over the telephone from her East Side studio, where she took a break from preparing for this year's crawl. My name is Louise Selecki Weir, and I am a sculptor. My work is quite figurative as opposed to abstract. I have a, a background in dance so that I like having a sort of a physicality in the works that I make. I'm working towards trying to get an emotional response from my viewer as opposed to perhaps an intellectual response from, from my viewer. For this year's call, I'm going to be showing my new series, uh, which is these babies that I've been working on. What I'm trying to get with the tools and materials, I suppose, in this work is a relational balance between precision and expression. With clay, you can be very precise or you can be very loose. So I have a bunch of tools that I use for my clay work. And these run from a dental caliper that will measure things in millimeters and uh, to a broken piece of wood, which would be more of a, you know, something that would give me an organic gestural mark and everything in between those. So the pieces I'm working with now, I've also been painting with oils. So brushes, paints, glazes, I'm trying to be quite delicate in my my use of color because really when you're working with sculpture you're working with form and color on form I think you have to be careful with so that you don't lose the form I would say I'm somebody who's a fairly good idea of what what I'm going to be doing as I'm tackling the piece so modeling tools are really almost an extension of your hands so I can do things with more delicacy using tools than I could necessarily do with my fingers. I need a spray bottle because when I'm working on clay over a long period of time, I need to keep this work workable. I'm really uh, enjoying using oil paints on my sculptures. I find that I can thin them out and that's been really fun to just to play around and with with color. You can overwork a surface in sculpture, the very same way you can work some a painting until you you know you work on it until you wreck it. So it's very important, I think, to have an appreciation of the looseness that you can bring to your artwork so that you recognize it when it's working. And it won't work every time, obviously, but sometimes you experiment and it's, ah, it's just, just right, just what you wanted. As you start to master something, I think it's, it is hard to get out of your groove 
you know, you need and, and keep it fresh. For the most part, I use tools how they were intended. If I were to make my own tool, which I do sometimes, I use them as, as I in, intended them to be used for. And the people who are making tools, some of them have really put an awful lot of thought into how these tools uh, need to be used. My mother used to say of me that I was a very good little girl. I would play mud pies outside and dance inside. <laughs> so this, uh, the fact that I started my life as a dancer, but also really loving to play in water, in, in the dirt, right? Dirt. And it, I was one of those kids with a garden hose out there making sloppy things. And it was the, the interaction with earth, with the earth, that is something that I pull into my work with clay. And it's just a, an ongoing spiritual development <laughs> in, in the relationship to, to the earth, I guess. There's something about the act of creation that taps into something very deep. It's a, not a verbal experience, so in a way, it's hard to, to articulate what that is. But what I'm tr trying to do with all of these little materials and tools is to, yeah, is to bring something that's quite deep inside, outside. And if I can, if I'm doing it correctly and I'm able to master my craft, then what I experience inside should in some ways be rather universal to other people because I am a being like you are a being like we are beings together together in this place, experiencing this place. And so I'm hoping that as an artist, when I'm reaching for my true experience, that it is going to be relatable for other people who don't have the time to make artworks or they're busy saving the planet, you know, or, or making our, our lives function. So what's my function, I think, is just to create this connection. And I'm, I'm doing it by trying to express something to the very best of my ability, like to try and master what I'm doing so that I can create the best performative piece in a sculpture or an artwork that I can present. Girish Shandok is an Indian-Canadian visual artist, primarily focused on painting and drawing. He lives and works in Vancouver, where he moved in 2015 from Dubai. Girish grew up in a conservative brown society in Delhi in the 1990s and hid his queerness as an attempt to blend in. Although he had a loving family, he always felt disconnected from everyone around him, and began drawing portraits from newspapers as a way of finding the connection he craved from other people, a practice he still uses to find inspiration and subject matter today. My name is Girish. I am an Indian-Canadian portrait artist, and uh, I primarily have been working in watercolour and inks. I do dabble in other uh, medium media as well. I, I mean... Um, but the last uh, big piece is the last major uh, part of the work I made has been in watercolor and inks. I'm not a professional artist yet. Uh, I have last, it's, it's been two to three years when I actually finally decided that enough is enough. I just can't just be dreaming about it. I need to do something about it. And I actually started to put uh, my, you know, just self to actually making art more seriously. And so finally, I think I'm at a point where I have enough work to at least have something to show. So yeah, this this year would be my introduction to Culture Crawl. So I would be there um, presenting uh, myself as a baby artist. <laughs> I think materials are so important. It's the conductor of your thought. It's, it's what actually documents what you're trying to say. You can have all these thoughts and you can have a wonderful 
uh, you know, hand, how you did muscle and all of that, but the transfer actually happens through materials. So it's very, very important. I have personally been a drawer for the longest time of my life. Drawing is how it started. Access to material has been uh, a big one. I think it probably happens to a lot of us when we start uh, early in life when you only have access to pens and pencils most of the times or just media which is just you know you draw with um, for someone like me I didn't have access to oil paint still very very late in life and uh, and I have an emotional response to just the way charcoal feels the softness of it and the hard lines you can make of it I'm just very much seduced by how slowly just charcoal spreads uh, thinly and I actually find that parallel with the watercolor as well. Just, just the, there's such certain, it's just very delicate. I see things in layer. I see, oh, there's a hint of green, but that kind of shifts into this light red over here. Oh, but then there's like an under layer of green and that has the yellow on top of that. Like that's how I kind of just break things down. And I find that, to, uh, I find it the easiest for me to be able to express it through watercolor in that way. The, the direction I'm at least heading in, it's been about, embracing what's coming my way and just kind of like you know letting the material do its thing I can kind of like just see oh I want to do this I have an idea but then let's see what becomes of it color is something I've been very very afraid of all my life so the color is something I'm embracing more so as I'm uh, growing older just because I'm opening up to it just because I think I'm becoming more comfortable into you know I'm coming into my own more so and I'm just becoming more comfortable within my own skin one day just decided you know what, what's the craziest thing I could do? And I was like, inks go with watercolor because of just water being the base medium for it. Let's just get them in. And that really changed uh, uh, the way uh, my work comes up, like, you know, the way my work is made. And now I actually really embrace it because it does give me something unexpected. And it also gives me a bunch of color. My literal thing was like, you want color? Bam, there, take that. And just like throw ink at it. And it was all the color I could ever ask for. You kind of like start to develop a library of your own in a way, like a Rolodex of your choices and how they turned out. So that experimentation also educates you. And so I think the more I'm doing it, the more I'm kind of finding my own lane, the more I'm finding my own do's and don'ts, the more I'm finding my own dares. Every time I do it, I do it, I push it in a different way. So it's daunting for sure, but uh, exciting. Uh, and uh, it's beca it becomes less daunting every time I do it. A lot of people are really scared to sometimes make art because they're always concerned about what's going to become of it rather than just re realizing that it's the process of making art, which is the verb of it is actually really exciting and fun too. And I think art carries that uh, inherent burden onto itself that it has to be good or it's just constantly going to be judged before you even start it. You shut yourself down. Nobody thinks about that when they just go for a walk. Like if it's going to be the best walk in the world or not, is somebody going to judge my walk the three hours I've spent? You know what I mean? And like everybody else, I'm sure I, I've also worried about for the longest time that what everybody's going to say. But I personally, as a self-critical person, I don't think there's anybody, any can, anyone could say that I haven't said to myself already. <laughs> so, but now it's at a point where I'm actually embracing the process of it. The process of it is really fun. The process of it is joyful. And what becomes of it, if there's a documentation of that time I've spent making art in three hours, if that documentation is appealing to somebody, that's awesome. If that documentation is appealing to me, great, I'll show it. If it's not, that's fine too, because it was a fun time. The more I'm uh, learning, the more I'm trying to break free. Let's try this differently. Oh, uh, you know, what if this happens? Uh, that uh, That is becoming a part of my curiosity. That is becoming a part of my process, process too use things a little bit differently. And it has been it has been a game changer for me because I get different textures, I get different results, I get I learn new things, I get a different visual, uh, you know, representation, I just didn't know how I would have been able to achieve. And uh, sometimes they're so specific to that very moment and that specific to that very application, I might not be able to ever recreate it. And uh, but that's that's the joy of it. That's uh, it's it's uh, becoming very integral to my process. And I absolutely recommend that to everybody. There is no rights and wrong in art. And at least the way I see it right now, just take a take take an hour for fun, ruin a tiny canvas for why not? Because you literally have nothing to lose.
I'm like a kid at candy store, at art supply store, like majority of my money goes to art supplies. And I'm just always looking at colors and I'm just fascinated by them and the materials. I just want to try them all. For watercolors, I have the pans of watercolor. Schminke. Schminke. Yeah, that's the that's the brand I've been using. And for oil paints, uh, my instructors have always just forced me to buy professional quality supplies uh, for oil paints. And I understand that now. Using a student grade uh, a paint and paper is great. Sure, it, it does exist. But using a professional quality paper and a professional quality pigment, it is a very different experience. It is not the same medium. It is literally a different medium. Invest a little bit extra money. Just a little bit more. Don't buy all the supplies at once. Maybe just buy individual tubes, one or two tubes, like maybe just primary colors for watercolor or just primary color pans or something. And just maybe a small pad. It is going to change the way you approach. It's going to be a lot less frustrating. It's going to be a lot more joyful. I have felt that sometimes shifting materials is a good thing to do, especially when you're working in the same material for a long time, just to break out just to shake things off and just to see things in a different way. Because once you come back to your materials, the good old trusted, what you do, it just gives you a different insight. It just gives you different ideas of using it. And then once you apply them in a different way, they give you a different effect altogether. Shake things up. It's, uh, it's, it's, not, gonna, it's not gonna steer you wrong. Born and raised in Kelowna, Tess Paul moved to the West Coast to study creative writing and film production at the University of British Columbia. An avid hiker, she sources imagery from personal photos and responds to them in the studio, building her paintings intuitively around a tone or colour, which results in a harmonious, variously hued monochrome aesthetic. I'm Tess Paul. I... I guess something that's special about how I work is I don't sketch first. I um, have an image and then I just start right away with the color and the canvas and see kind of where that takes me. So it's very intuitive. I just got a new studio at Shady Acres Studio. I'm very excited about. So that was luckily within the boundaries of Culture Crawl. Um, so it'll be my first year. I'm gonna show kind of just what I'm working on for my galleries and also try to do some smaller pieces that people can buy kind of on a whim. I've tried a lot of different art mediums in my career. I went to film school. I like majored in film, minored in creative writing. So I didn't always think I was gonna be a visual artist. And I think why I gravitated towards working with paint is the lifestyle and the control of like a single entity like doing the whole project by myself is very appealing to me. I'm able to have something in my head and then make it um, more easily with acrylic than I've ever been able to do with any other medium. I've done some like pastels and charcoal and stuff when I've been in like art school. Uh, the vibrancy of acrylic and just like the drawing time, what I'm able to achieve really quickly is is really appealing about acrylics. Mostly I have a couple brushes that are like, I guess like an inch that I get used to death. So um, those are my favorite, but then I also have a big seven inch brush that I do some like big um, kind of broken lines with, and I enjoy that. I think playing with brush size is really integral to getting like an interesting painting, just so that it's more varied. It, like my work starts in a very like abstract place because of that like big brush that I start out with. And then I sort of like zone in and make it a little bit more concise and it starts to look like something kind of later in the process. So I think it the bigger brush like forces me to keep it abstract and like, it kind of takes on its like spirit of the piece with the bigger brush. And then I rein it in as the piece goes to kind of look like a waterfall or look like a tree or something. There's, I think this like lovely push and pull and painting between like having something in your head and also like kind of trusting the process and seeing what comes out of what you do not without thinking, but just, just more intuitively and using a bigger brush or like something kind of heavier that you can't control. It helps, helps with that push pull dynamic that you can um, 
used to your advantage or it can be very frustrating. There has to be an element of surprise for sure. And like different tools help with that. I use the Opus acrylics actually, because I, I have used golden before, but they're just a little bit more expensive and I don't find there's much difference between the Opus paint and the golden paint, um, except for maybe, I don't know, the odd like fluorescent. So I mostly use the Opus paints and I actually like water them down quite a bit to get almost like um like a fluidy, like more fluid um, consistency. And then um, I'll like kind of double dip my brush a lot. And that's again, like an experimentation. I don't work a lot with like impasto or like knife work or anything. Everything's very like kind of fluid and flowy. And I want kind of the brush strokes to all kind of like come together in like a fluid sort of wave-like way. I recently kind of just changed my style from a very like graphic style where every color ended and began at a certain point and it, it maybe lended itself more to like a printmaking or something. Like I was sort of like not working with the paint I'd say. And now I'm kind of easing up more into like trusting it and being surprised with it and like flowing like brush strokes together not being so scared and, and it is for me it's always giving up that control it's tough but then I'm always like really pleased when I do <laughs> so it's very much like a mental game there you have to experiment to grow so I kind of hit a point where I was not like just like bored of what I was doing so you could do have to like I think at that that point was what I did was just like relying more on the paint and the brushes and not trying to make them do something that I wanted them to do. And that's the experimentation that gives you a new end result. I think painting is like life. So it's like that Taoist thing of like, you step in the river, it's never the same river. Um, so I try to live by that and not force anything. And then you notice that like when you paint and you don't force anything, it also helps. So not be so precious about your work, I guess would be the tip. And if you have to like rip the canvas off the frame and start again, like just like don't be afraid of that. It's what, like $30 to like re like staple the canvas on. Like just like I had to, when I started, I would rip them off. Oh my gosh, like five, 10 times off the same frame and just kept going and going. And most of my day would be like restapling the canvas onto the frame but it's so important to go through that and to not have that be like a barrier to your like growing as an artist. When it comes together, it is very exciting, but there is something also really wonderful about starting with a blank canvas and just kind of letting it rip. I've only been a professional artist for like a couple years. So there's, um, there's quite a bit of uh, growing I still need to do. And I really want to work more with like computers and AI and I love that stuff. I don't think it's our enemy, I think it's our friend. <laughs> Pick the medium that you find the easiest to work with, like put the less, least amount of obstacles in your way that you can. That's kind of what I did with acrylic. And then you can branch out from there once you've like got something that you can express yourself really easily with, then the world's kind of your oyster and you can just kind of give her in like other areas as well. But start start with something that you, you find easy that comes most naturally to you. Since 2016, Brandy Mars has been running the gayest little gift shop in the land. Her collection of art includes over 300 pieces aiming to bring representation to the LGBTQIA plus community. She has written and illustrated two children's books, and her product line has extended to home goods, clothing, as well as the classic posters, canvas prints, and greeting cards she began with. I do a little bit of everything. So I do like some digital stuff. I do oil, acrylic, ink, pencil. My store is so big now, like there's kind of, some of everything. I have like a studio in a building with a bunch of other artists. And so we're having like a pre-crawl show. And then that's the weekend before the actual crawl. And then during the crawl, um, it's like the normal crawl where you go, you go, everyone can come and like check out where I, where I make everything. And yeah. So it's kind of like an art studio slash store. So right now like you can book an appointment to come. 
I've been like fighting with, with social media since like the very beginning, since like for this entire eight years, it's been like a battle. I was paying Facebook for advertising and then they would like constantly take down my ads, even though like they were just like holding hands or something. So I just recently made a couple of pieces that are like a lot more racy and it's not something I would normally would do, but I was more just like, you're treating me like I do this and I don't do this. And I was like, I may as well. What do I have to lose? Like you're like treating me like I'm a criminal. And that's kind of ironic because the whole point of why I started this company was to kind of to make something that didn't exist, which was like art that was um, about more than just like um, I just felt like a lot of lesbian art was like over sexualized. And um, so I wanted to make something like better or like more from the female gaze. I am so tired of fighting with them about like women holding hands, just constantly taking it down, taking it down, taking it down. Like, how am I supposed to build a business when I'm being censored so much? Originally, I was doing like a acrylic for like a really, really long time, like my whole life, pretty much. Um, and then I got into oil because I really liked how like blendy, melty you can make everything. And like the fact that you can like go back later and change stuff. This apartment is really small. And uh, because of oil painting, like off gassing, I was like, how can I do this without breathing that? <laughs> so that's kind of how I've like started to like move some of my stuff into digital. But I still like really love, like I love using actual paint. It just like feels nice. It's very like cathartic. Growing up, I always was like, I'm so jealous of this person because they have a style, but I guess I have one now. I feel like everything I make kind of looks like I made it. I don't really describe it, but I've had other people describe it as like ethereal or like um, kind of whimsical, soft, like feminine, kind of, yeah, very gay. <laughs> everything I go through in my life, it like comes through in my art. <laughs> and people who know me will like call me and be like, are you okay? I saw your painting. <laughs> <laughs> it's not so much like the medium it's more just like about kind of expressing and like connecting with other people through art um which I guess is really like the whole point of art is connection so you go through someone else's studio um and to get into my studio when I moved in I, I like painted the floor and like made it all like really nice um but it's also like a space to be messy that's like kind of like the whole point so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have been painting like both with acrylic and with oil since I moved in. I think that digital is like really interesting because like when I started in digital, I don't think it was like really super accepted. I think it was just like kind of frowned on more. I lived in New West and I just had this like the worst printer you could buy. It was like $20 and then where the ink is like $200, <laughs> that kind. And it printed everything out sideways. And I used to cut all the cards by hand. It's totally like lunatic thing. And um, it, like the apartment was hot. So it's like, I'd have to cut like three or four of them. Cause it's like, I'd be like, get, I'm obsessive. And like, I'd get like a fingerprint on it. I'd be like, oh, I have to make a new one. So it was like, that's how it all started. But now I make everything. It's like, I, I made chocolate bars too. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. I'm just like, have all this energy and I need to do something with it. I think it, it's all about the art. And then I'm be like, oh, hey, I, well, the idea was for Valentine's Day. I was like, oh my God, it'd be so cute if I made chocolate bars and I put like my art on them. So I did it. And I get very excited about new paint. <laughs> I love going to Opus actually. Oh my God, I could spend like the whole day in there. I love everything in here. I get like so inspired. I don't want to make stuff just to make money. I want to like make something that's like meaningful. And I think people can feel that too in your art. And that maybe that's the problem with a lot of like lesbian art that I used to see is I was like, the feeling is not, doesn't feel like legit or whatever. So I never want my art to be like that where I'm just like feeling a, a void that I think people want. It's like, to make something that's like like meaningful to you and then I think other people are like attracted to that energy somehow I don't really know how I like do what I do <laughs> kind of I just make things I feel like sometimes you have to like live more and then you can like make more stuff 
So if I like, I can't just like be like, oh, I'm just going to like magically make this like an epic painting that's going to be a bestseller, you know, you just need to like live your life and then you can use that life experience to like make something. But one of the things that I found really like cool and interesting is like um, how there's so many people and some of us have the same mediums, but like none of us make the same thing which I think is so interesting and amazing. Like you can, I don't know. I think that everyone has, it's like a fingerprint kind of thing. Like no one really will ever make the exact same thing as someone else. We've still got a few final words from Louise Garish, Tess and Brandy. But as we wrap up our Materials at Work theme, I'd like to thank them and all the other artists who've shared their experience and insight over the past few episodes. From a passion to different mediums through the art essentials and showing work at events like The Crawl, I think it's clear that no matter what our practice and despite our different artistic approaches, we and our tools are partners in creativity. It's a deep and meaningful everyday connection, a truly magical alliance at the core of what we do. And now finally, to finish things off with a bit of fun, canvas and paint sticks and mile sticks and oil paints, pastels and pencils and sketchbooks and rulers, watercolors, brushes and stuff for inking. These are a few of our favorite things. With the holidays just around the corner, we thought we'd find out what today's artists would ask for if someone wanted to buy them a gift of art supplies. I wanted brushes, paint brushes, good paint brushes. Quite secretly, when I'm not sculpting, I am also painting. And I started painting in order to inform my sculpture. What I don't have are any of those nice wide ones where you can really move uh, and, and do some, yeah, big, big, bold strokes. And one of the reasons I wanted to do more painting was because my sculpture is very precise. And I thought with painting, maybe I could loosen up a little, you know, and, and uh be more expressive. I have so many things. <laughs> right now, I would say I would get a big set of watercolor tubes. Also, oil sticks. I think I'm trying. Ex I'm starting to experiment with oil sticks uh, because I'm starting to experiment with oil paints again slowly. I definitely would love like the full like Adobe Suite and then an Oculus and like a faster computer. Um, those. That's another reason I gravitated to painting is it's like a little bit less expensive to get going than like digital mediums. If someone ha like had like was going to get me like the biggest present ever, like those huge the easels that have like the wheels and stuff. Oh my gosh, <laughs> they're so nice. Yeah, that's like my dream easel. <laughs> I don't even know if it would, I could get it in here. Well, I could. There are a few, a few of them. I saw them downtown. And I was like, ah. <laughs> just like drool in Opus. I hope you've enjoyed this slightly longer than normal episode. We've got lots going on in the next couple of months with plenty of ways to support local artists and engage with the incredible creative community we're all fortunate to be part of. As well as the usual demos and Insta activities, we'll be launching our holiday gift guide, annual Art Brings Us Together giving program. And yes, I will be back too. This time, shining the spotlight on a handful of Opus staff as they share some of their favorite items and gift ideas. Till then, thanks for listening. <laughs>